Shimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 28, Text 44. Tasmad Imam, the yogi, can be in the self-realized position after conquering the insurmountable spell of Maya, who presents herself as both the cause and effect of this material manifestation and is therefore very difficult to understand. Purport. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita that the spell of Maya, which covers the knowledge of the living entity, is insurmountable. However, one who surrenders unto Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, can conquer the seemingly insurmountable spell of Maya. Here also it is stated that the Daivi Prakriti, or the external energy of the Supreme Lord, is Dorvi Bhavya, very difficult to understand and very difficult to conquer. One must, however, conquer this insurmountable spell of Maya and this is possible by the grace of the Lord when God reveals himself to the surrendered soul. It is also stated here, Swarupena Vatishtate. Swarupa means that one has to know that he is not the supreme soul, but rather part and parcel of the supreme soul. That is self-realization. To think falsely that one is the supreme soul and that one is all-pervading is not Swarupa. This is not realization of his actual position. The real position is the one. The real position is that one is part and parcel. It is recommended here that one remain in that position of actual self-realization. In Bhagavad Gita, this understanding is defined as Brahman realization. After Brahman realization, one can engage in the activities of Brahman. As long as one is not self-realized, he engages in activities based on false identification with the body. When one is situated in his real self, then the activities of Brahman realization begin. The Mayavadi philosophers say that after Brahman realization, all activities stop. But that is not actually so. If the soul is so active in its abnormal condition, existing under the covering of matter, how can one deny its activity when free? An example may be cited here. If a man in a diseased condition is very active, how can one imagine that when he is free from the disease, he will be inactive? Naturally, the conclusion is that when one is free from all disease, his activities are pure. It may be said that the activities of Brahman realization are different from those of conditional life, but that does not stop activity. This is indicated in Bhagavad Gita. After one realizes oneself to be Brahman, devotional service begins. Madhbhaktim labhate param. After Brahman realization, one can engage in the devotional service of the Lord. Therefore, devotional service of the Lord is activity in Brahman realization. For those who engage in devotional service, there is no spell of maya, and their situation is perfect. The duty of the living entity, as part and parcel of the whole, is to render devotional service to the whole. That is the ultimate perfection of life. Tasmadidam swam prakritim daivim sadasaratmikam durvibhavyam parabhavya sarupena avatishtate. Thus the yogi can be in the self-realized position after conquering the insurmountable spell of maya who presents herself as both the cause and effect of this material manifestation and is therefore very difficult to understand. Durvi bhavyam means very difficult to understand the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is insurmountable because it is presenting itself in a way which is not obvious. It presents itself as the cause and the effect of this material world. When it presents itself as the cause of things, it does so 
by making us think that we are the cause. This is a very clever way of getting things done. When you want to do something, if you make somebody else do it, but at the same time you make them think that they're the ones who are doing it, then you've very nicely accomplished your purposes. The external energy of the Lord makes it so that it seems that the living entities here in this material world are all engaged in activities which are performing all the different affairs of the material nature. But actually, that is not so, for the living entity is strictly under the control of the material nature. The living entities perform so many activities and so many results of those activities are there. These are the effects of one's actions. Those effects are also not us, the living entity, but rather are products of our work. Factually, the work itself is part of the material energy and the product itself is part of the material energy. But it seems as if both the cause and the effect are coming from other sources. Just like we think of ourselves as the doers of activities. But factually, this is carried out by nature. So although all these activities are factually carried out by nature because of the deluding potency of maya, it seems as if we are doing it all. Now, we are embodying maya. We are the embodiments of maya because of our false ego, which has created the situation whereby we are thinking ourselves the doers, the enjoyers, the controllers. Therefore, we think of ourselves as the cause and the effect of this material activity. Yes, also one thinks of himself as the effect. It's like an artist who paints a painting. Somebody who does something creative. He considers himself the cause of that thing and he considers that that thing is him. It's his byproduct. In the same way that one may consider a child to be a byproduct and thus part and parcel of his body, an artist may think that his painting is a byproduct, a part and parcel of his body. Especially artists, they always think like that. They're the most attached people on this planet. Yeah. So we find that this Maya goes like that. It makes us think that we are the performers of activities, and the activities we perform create results which are ours. They are a product of our existence, our energies, our intelligence, and they are ours. All the things I make, all the things I create, they are mine, and they are me. Sometimes we even find that even after making something, people make in the contracts of sale that it cannot be used for this or it cannot be used for that and it should be used for this and it should be used for that. Uh, and especially these very uh, so-called important works of art or things like that. They tell you what you can do with it and what you can't do with it. You can hang it there, but you can't hang it there. Uh, the conditions are there of sale. So, one is so much attached to something which is nothing but a product of the modes of nature. After all, again using the example of art, although you could use all kinds of examples, music or a sporting event or writing, every, every creative activity, practically, sweeping the floor. One can see that uh, it's simply the modes of nature producing these things. 
One is this body, the body has qualities, characteristics of the modes, mixture of passion, goodness, ignorance, in different degrees, and therefore skills and abilities manifest. That is simply a product of the modes of nature. And then, with those skills and abilities, which are a combination of the modes, one takes elements, which are also a combination of the modes, and does things within the modes of nature, generally influenced by passion and ignorance, and then creates results which are similarly within the modes of nature, generally passion. We find that everything is under the modes of nature because the modes of nature are the cause and the modes of nature are similarly the effect. Because everything within this entire creation is actually a product of the modes of material nature except the living entity and the supreme. The spiritual energy, this means like also Krishna's abode, his dhammas, his transcendental abodes, they are not also under the modes of nature. But everything else is simply a product of these modes of nature. Even Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma's creations, these are all different manifestations of the modes of nature. Therefore, a wise person, when he looks and sees things within this material world, he does not see things which are separated from the material energy. He does not consider that now I have become separate from the material energy and all that which I produce is a product of myself only. Rather, he sees everything that goes on with the body and all the products of the body. These are all the influence of maya. And yet he, the spirit soul, is transcendental to all of that. When one fully realizes this, he is capable of coming to the platform of sarupa. Rupa means form, sva means one's own. The spiritual form and personality of the living entity. Svarupena vivastiti. We all have an original spiritual form. And when one understands that everything of this material nature is just a product of the material energy, and the living entity actually is beyond this, and that actually we are part and parcel of Krishna, Krishna's eternal servants, then we have a possibility of coming to the platform of sarupa. Our own spiritual form. Of course, we have skipped many steps. But sarupa, spiritual form, is available to those who are engaged in Krishna's direct service. Not those who consider either the material nature to be all in all, who accept this illusion that the material energy is the cause and effect. If you accept this illusion that the material nature is both the cause and effect of this material existence, and there's nothing more than that, then you are known as being in maya. Because although it is so, that is simply another illusion. Because Krishna stands behind this prakriti as its source. And as Krishna stands behind maya dakshena prakriti suyate satraturam I am behind this whole material energy. By my order, all moving and non-moving beings are created doing so many things. Everything goes on under Krishna's control. When one sees behind the veil of maya, it is a grand show. It's like a veil, like a curtain, which hangs in front of and behind the stage. Behind the stage, they put a curtain, making you always, generally people think that behind these curtains there's a big room or something like that. And usually it's just a brick wall. It's a curtain of illusion, or they drop some scenery. 
And in front, there's also a curtain. One may see through that curtain and think, it's like Maya has many veils in front. And some of them are thicker, some of them are not so thick. Maya also cleverly allows the living entity to think that he's looking through the veil and seeing the truth behind it. Just like these curtains that are on the windows with the, the very, the very thin, light, white. Uh, from outside you may not see. And from inside you may see something outside. So you are thinking, you are looking through and seeing something special. Yeah. One is thinking that he's looking through the curtain of Maya. Sometimes a very thin curtain is there. And he thinks he's seeing something very special. Because he's seen through this little curtain and he's found something there. Sometimes these people who are very much interested in esoteria uh, of all different platforms, they're looking through the little curtain. And they're thinking, now we know the secret behind this illusion. But Maya is very clever. She just puts different forms of curtain there. You can go through a couple of these thin, thin curtains and see on the other side something and consider yourself to be freed from illusion. But Maya is so clever that Maya keeps us in illusion even though we are looking through these thin curtains. Because there's a lot of these thin curtains. And the real curtains on the other side, very thick, you can't see through it. Sometimes they get to that point also. Higher planetary systems, highest planetary system, they think. Now we have achieved that point where we see everything because now there's nothing beyond this curtain. This other curtain there is the final one. But it's not so also. There is furthermore, beyond that, the whole spiritual realm, which is actually the basis upon which the whole stage is set of this material existence. The director, producer of the material nature is Krishna. And the whole arrangement of maya goes on under his direction alone. Yeah. Everything goes on under his direction. Maya. Maya always puts one in illusion, making one think that it is not possible or something like this. Always. But the director of Maya, the producer of this whole show, is the supreme personality of God. So Maya is not actually the cause and effect. Maya just seems to be. And we who are in Maya, we think of ourselves as cause and effect. But it's not so. It just seems to be. Even when you start at the smallest Ourselves, we are the smallest. And you move out to the largest, you think, here's the cause and effect, here's the cause and effect, here's the cause and effect. But until you get to Krishna, you cannot actually see what is the cause and what is the effect. Uh, the real effect is very great. It's Krishna's whole material arrangement with its unlimitedly expansive uh, opulences in different ways. Nobody can understand everything within this material world even. You can't even understand fully the effect of the material nature. It's not possible. Uh, the material nature is far beyond even our own comprehension. Even if we're very great. Even if one is Lord Brahma, he can only understand the material energy of this one universe, not more. When Lord Brahma saw all the other Brahmas come to Krishna to pay obeisances and they didn't even know that the others were there, our Lord Brahma was looking in astonishment and wondering how this could be that he's only one of many Brahmas and there are many universes and he didn't understand this and he's in the smallest universe. So even your Lord Brahma, you don't understand the whole creation. Who can understand this entire cosmic manifestation? All of the laws of cause and effect, they are very, very subtle, very, very powerful. The living entity has a very hard time understanding what is cause, what is effect. Because even something which may not seem to be a cause can turn to be a cause in this material world. 
Even some small thing can turn out to be a very big thing later on. Yeah. Some persons find this out in disease condition where they make a, where they get some kind of contamination which spreads all over the body and causes it trouble like anything. They see this in terms of uh, the law. Sometimes somebody breaks some very small law and gets himself all entangled. Or sometimes you make an enemy and you don't even know how. Yeah. Maybe one day you stepped on somebody's foot and he never forgot that. Wanted to spend the whole rest of his life to get back at you. Yeah. Some small little thing can create so much trouble in this world because nobody really understands what is a cause. Anything, anything you do in this world can cause unlimited problems. The smallest thing. If you act in the wrong way, immediately so many problems. That makes one pretty paranoid. Makes one not even want to act in this world. Yeah. Of course, the madhouses are filled with such people who sit in the corner all day and chew their fingernails. Afraid to do the slightest thing. Because they know everything they do makes trouble. But that makes trouble too. You can't win. This material world is not meant for success. It is actually meant to teach us a good lesson. Failure is the pillar of real success. And what is that failure? Failure to remember Krishna, failure to surrender to Krishna. And what is that real success? The ability to surrender to Krishna with loving devotion. Crying out to the Lord, Krishna! That sincere cry of loving devotion will attract the Lord. Sincere cry. But that you can only do when one actually has understood something. When he has actually understood. There's no solution in this material world. So long as one thinks there's a material solution to these material problems, he'll never be able to surrender to Krishna fully. Even those who merge, want to merge into Brahman, they cannot surrender to Krishna because they think this is a solution. There's no more suffering condition when I merge. Or those who are coming to the absurd conclusion of voidism, they think there's no need to surrender when I, as everything's nothing, it'll be all fine. But these conclusions are against the logic that we find anywhere presented in the Vedic literatures. The logic is very simple. That if the Supreme is devoid of qualities, how can the emanations be filled with qualities? If the emanations are filled with qualities, the Supreme must also have qualities, but in the greater degree. These solutions of impersonalism or voidism are not solutions at all. They are just temporary states whereby one may forget his real business. Yeah. We are, uh, by necessity, meant to just surrender to Krishna. There is no other solution than that. Often we concoct many other solutions, many other forms of protection, many other activities which can so-called give us shelter. There is no shelter in this material world because it is simply the material nature presenting various forms of its own causes and effects under the direction of the illusory potency. Why should the material nature grant us very nice, favorable conditions? What would be the cause? And since we have committed so many sinful activities in the past, why should we just get, without deserving it, so many nice results? By our activities, we should suffer, and we do. And then there's some enjoyment, too, because of our activities. When we are enjoying, we think, now this is everything. Forget about all spiritual advancement. Let us just enjoy now as much as we can. 
because it will be over soon. And when suffering is going on, we think, let us become pious and worship the Lord so that we'll get as much sense gratification as we can in the future so we can enjoy. But so long as one has got this fruit of mentality, then one will always be thrown again and again into various suffering conditions of life. Fruit of mentality is there on the conditioned souls who are completely bewildered. Some are so bewildered, they think of themselves as the supreme. Or some are so bewildered, they think there is no supreme. So Krishna is not like us. He's never bewildered. He always knows what is right. And if we take shelter of him, we shall also always know what is right. Those who take full shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, even in the midst of greatest disturbances, are never shaken. Those who have attained Krishna's lotus feet are always convinced that they are under the complete protection of the Supreme Personality of God. Krishna protects, even if sometimes it seems as if he has put us in a situation where we are getting into more trouble, still he protects us. Perhaps he is teaching us something. Perhaps he is accomplishing his purposes. Or perhaps he is just helping us after we have made many mistakes. But Krishna will protect us. There's no doubt about it. If we just take shelter of him, he will protect us. But if we think of ourselves as independent, as soon as we think of ourselves as independent, then we get into trouble. Independence means you're in trouble. Because there is no independent condition in this material world. We are all dependent. Dependent on Krishna, dependent on Krishna's mercy. We have to always surrender to Him in great love and devotion. Otherwise, our existence will become filled with all kinds of problematic ideas, desires, activities. Don't think surrendering to Krishna is something you do only when spiritual master tells you. It's something you do all the time. One has to always come before the Lord, pray to Him, take shelter to Him. Please grant me the intelligence by which I'll be able to surrender unto you more. Throw oneself down before the Lord and beg of Him to help us because we are so much contaminated in the material world. And Krishna is so nice that He allows us to come before Him with our problems like this and say, please help. And He does. And He offers His love to us. He proves it by His protection of His devotees. Whereas the devotees often prove their own maya by sometimes rejecting Krishna or not caring about him or not being interested to come and see him. This is the maya of the material world where we develop independent, separatist ideas. Separatist is one who sees his interests and the interests of the Lord as different. Uh, One who sees his interests and the interests of his uh, spiritual Master or the spiritual movement is different. One who thinks himself to be independent, he's a separatist. Himself from the spiritual energy. Such person should be nothing but uh, encouraged to come again in contact with Krishna, who is the most loved object, lovable object of the devotee. Krishna is the one to whom all our love should flow. When one is, of course, actually a lover of Krishna, then there's no need to say such a thing. His love will flow towards Krishna like the Ganges flows towards the sea. You cannot stop it. Even you make a dam, you cannot stop it. Because it will just go around your dam or knock over your dam unless you let it go through. You have to let it go through at its own rate. (laughs) Otherwise... It's all going to knock over everything at one point or another. 
course, you may make a little lake there if you like, but you cannot stop it. So, one has to understand Krishna fully. Understand Krishna, see Krishna, uh, come to the temple, worship Krishna, engage in Krishna's service, and always be thinking of how to expand that which will satisfy Krishna. What else is there to do in this material world? If we try to engage ourselves in sense gratification, we will succeed, but we will become miserable. And if we try to engage ourselves in Krishna's service, we will also succeed and become happy. So both require attempt, but the result is completely different. Therefore, the devotees of the Lord should fully 100% engage themselves in Krishna's service and be very satisfied serving Krishna, very happy, and enthusiastically increase that service more and more. There is no other solution. Uh, chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. All right, Hare Krishna.